I did my PhD in economics at George Mason University. I have a weird accent and a weird name. That's because I'm from Sweden. I did my undergrad in Sweden in economics before I came to the United States, and now I work at William Blair as a uh, senior macro analyst for their macro allocation strategies team. So that is, I in broad uh, terms, my, my background here. And I have been passionate about special economic zones now for several years. Um, it came to me as a topic of development economics. I wanted to find something that actually works. You, uh, there are many reasons to call economics the dismal science. One of them, I would say, is development economics, because there are so many things that sh we think that's going to work, and they don't work. Now, special economic zones is one of these things that I found intriguing and very promising, and I started to look into it. And I want to share with you today some of my takeaways from my research and my thinking about the foreign trade zones of the United States. And I think it is appropriate to start with special economic zones on a day like today. We're thinking about special jurisdictions. You are going to be hearing uh, from a lot of interesting people here, uh, not only on special economic zones, of course, but special economic zones is one of these things. And by the way, I'm going to give you one acronym, if you'll indulge me, SECs, Special Economic Zones. I am going to use that from now on. Um, SECs is um, one of these special jurisdictions that's been around for a long time. And I think it's appropriate to start there for that reason, because we can learn so many, many things from these zones and from what has actually worked and not. And I'm going to give you my thoughts on how to actually understand what works and so on. So let's go ahead. I have my slides over here. So I hope that the people in the back have a chance to see them. I don't know if it's too much light on them. Take that back. Uh, <laughs> so what are special economic zones? What am I actually talking about? There are so many forms of special economic zones. These can be really large, the ones that you probably have heard about from China. Uh, we're talking Zhenzhen, 20 million people. I want to talk to you more about China because I think it's a fascinating example. Um, really what it is in a nutshell is it's an area that the government designates as having different rules from the rest of the country. That can be a lot of different things. It can be huge zones, as I mentioned, but it can also be really, really small industrial parks. It sometimes is just one company. Uh, there are zones that are one floor or one office building, uh, and they call it a zone. And I think that anyone who studies special economic zones wants to think about when does it actually make sense to call it a zone and when should we call it something else? Because it's going to be quite unfair to say whether zones work or not if we don't draw some distinctions here. But in broad terms, it can be state-funded, really regula re regulated areas that are really close to any industrial policy project that you might think about. Of course, that also is something that falls under development economics that people are studying. Uh, put a lot of infrastructure in air and see what happens kind of thing. It can be uh, deregulated areas uh, where you have more autonomy. They're going to have a very different dynamic. And I think it's important to try to understand when this dynamic is a beneficial one, when might the dynamic come about that you were hoping for, and so on. So very different sorts here. Um, usually how these work is that you give incentives to investors. Often these come as in the form of fiscal incentives, taxes, tariff exemptions. And why does this make sense? Because often the special economic zones is a way for a developing country to attract investors that usually don't want to go there uh, for various reasons, but often it's a matter of restrictive trade policies. Classical example, uh, Haynes wants to make a t-shirt, they want to import the cotton from the United States. Tariffs are really high. Labor is cheap in whatever country they are. Let's say they are in Nicaragua or Dominican Republic. But they want this tariff exemption because that's when you can make the business case actually established there. The country wants them there because they want them to hire uh, the workers there to give those uh, opportunities. So they say, hey, if you invest in the zone, you can enjoy these tariff exemptions that you're asking for. Pure and simple, right? Um, 
But as I mentioned, and I want to get back to a couple of times here, some of the zones that you're going to see, and as we're going to find out, we're going to see in the United States too, are just really just one company. And I uh, go so far as to say that it's not really an SEC. Now, we still need to talk about it because it is this kind of form of zone that people will refer to as being one of the most successful zones because you can look at the data in terms of how much they export and conclude that they are actually successful. And I'm going to be very critical on that view. You will note that I, I think that zones have a lot of promise, but there are a lot of problems that people are often overlooking. I want us to, to consider those, those things. Um, the most common form of an SAC is really the industrial park. This is the one you see uh, throughout Asia, in Latin America a lot. This is manufacturing, often textiles, uh, zones with anything from 10 to maybe 100 businesses within a fence. Nobody lives in the zone. Workers come in over day and then they walk out in the evening and they work all day. So the sweatshop kind of model not as horrific conditions as you might, you might think when you think about the word, word sweatshop, but that's, that's the most common model. And I think that when most people think about SECs, that's what they're thinking about, and that are appropriately so, because that's, that's, uh, it's a very common one. Uh, in a way, if you would count the zones, you would have get more uh, single factory zones, but they are, of course, so small, so in the broader scheme of things, I would say the industrial park is, is, is the most common. Uh, what else? Um, Except for fiscal um, uh, incentives, you often have also uh, administrative and regulatory uh, incentives. And what these are is often what a country tries to do is to streamline administration. Uh, you want to register a business uh, in these zones. We're making it easier for you than if you would have registered outside the zone. The regulatory front, it can be environmental, it can be labor, other regulations. We're giving you certain exemptions for that to make it more attractive for you. So those are the ideas there. Uh, just to mention a couple of numbers here. Uh, nobody knows how many zones there are in the world. The best estimate would come from somewhere from the ILO numbers, three to 5,000. Uh, most countries have them, and that's uh, what's interesting here, that it's not, this is not some policy that is really new. And it's not something that is uh, very unusual. It, it's, it's, you have so many countries with these. And, it's, and often when people talk about I investing in a country, they often over overlook that it's actually in the zone, that they would never consider uh, investing somewhere else. But they, they more or less take it for granted that they can invest in the zone. Uh, so that's why I was surprised to see when I started my studies that there wasn't that much analysis of them. Usually what the analysis is about is to look at, say, export in within the zone area before and after the zone was established. And uh, implicitly, uh, the conclusion is usually that if you increase exports in the area, it's a good idea, or it, it succeeded. And that's the analysis that I'm trying to make and actually uh, trying to understand, is this really a good idea? When are these zones actually good for the country as a whole? Because that's the perspective I take. Not, are they good for the investors? It's, uh, it, are they actually good for the country as a development policy? Is it a good idea? Um, as I mentioned, it's nothing new about these zones. Um, they've been along around for a long time. It's really around the 50s where you saw the establishment of these industrial park model zones, uh, and then they came about in several of these, you might not see the full list here, but a list of Asian countries here, Thailand, Malaysia, India, uh, most of them established them somewhere 60s, 70s. Uh, so uh, several Asian countries had them before China, that's an important uh, point to make here. China established zones in 1978, 79, and uh, most, uh, sometimes people think that they were the first just because they're most known for it. And they did do a lot to re really spur the proliferation of zones throughout the world because they set an example how zones actually can be really dynamic and, and uh, change an economy as a whole over time. So I would say China uh, really made the zones more popular. You often see references to the Chinese zones from other countries then trying to either reform their zone programs or setting up new zone programs altogether, saying, China did this, China did that, and therefore we're going to try to do the same. It's not always going to be that easy, right? And it hasn't been, uh, but that's the idea. But so many countries did it first. China 
80s, 90s started to be really a big thing. Uh, lately, you've seen several African countries establishing zones. 90s and the noughties is really the big uh, time where you had a lot of African countries establishing zone programs for the, last, for the first time. Um, so that's that, a little bit of history. So what is the point of special economic zones, really? Often, what a government will say, why do we establish these zones? They're going to say, well, we're going to increase exports, we're going to increase employment, um, we're going to have uh, product increased production and things like that. Measurable, nice macro data that you can look at before and after uh, within these zones, and you can establish th whether they actually succeeded. Now, I think that you should all take a... a put your skeptical hats on here when, whenever anyone is saying this, because one, you can, whatever, whatever goal you're setting for yourself, if you want to make sure you accomplish it, you, you make sure that you're setting a goal that you can accomplish. Um, now, just because you increase exports in an area doesn't mean that it's good for the economy as a whole. Um, if I give export subsidies to a, a company and I say, uh, my goal here with this policy is to increase exports. Hereby, I will give $1 million to any company that exports. Uh, lo and behold, you get more exports. No, 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 nobody's in here. Um, you're all smart people, and uh, most, more or less, you probably think like an eco economist. Huh, there are t alternative costs here. There, there's a, a, another story here. There, there's a cost to what is ac this actual policy. You understand that, yes, production is good. Exports can be good, but there's a cost in terms of, if you have to pay somebody to do something, th that payment is a cost, and we cannot overlook that. Uh, and it's a little bit similar to the special economic zones, and that's why I think the macro data does not really is a good measure of actual zone success. Uh, now, you, you think maybe I'm just going to bash zones all along. I want to start a little bit negative so I can finish off so that you remember me as this po optimistic and positive person. That's my strategy. Um, now, another uh, goal here is, is technological transfer. That's something you find in a lot of like World Bank uh, reports. They're going to say, because you have all these multinationals coming in and then you have the local companies and they can all like be there in this cluster and they're gonna meet over coffee and they're gonna start trading with each other and gonna learn the technology from each other and you get technological transfer. This is what is called the kind of a dynamic effect of, of special economic zones. It's not this direct, we are hiring this many people and let's count the jobs. This is something that is much harder to measure uh, and there are some institutions that have been trying to do this. Um, but it, it is tricky, uh, but in, in theory, it's kind of there. And uh, you can be skeptical of this too, I am a little bit, but uh, it, certainly sometimes it will happen. It, and then the question is always going to be, well, does it happen to the extent that you can justify whatever cost you're incurring to s establishing these zones? So um, I, I, I find it lacking the kind of cost-benefit thinking of zones. And what makes it so hard to do this is because if you want to think about the development uh, in the country as a whole, um, how do you measure that? So an economist will sit down and say, okay, let's think about growth in the econ economy as a whole, and let's look at before and after a particular policy, right? So let's say, let's say you're president of the United States and you want to cut taxes, right? And it's, and it's, uh, uh, and you, you slash the corporate tax and you want to try to see like what, I, what was the growth the decade before and the decade after we, we, we cut the tax. Well, any economist that looks at your paper where you have a one variable regression is then going to come up and say, well, you didn't control for this and you didn't control for that and, and, and that's going to be completely correct because a lot of things always change otherwise in an economy. So you throw all these variables in there, and the more you th throw, throw in, the harder it is going to be to find any effect of the actual policies that, that you had. And that just means that it is actually really, really hard to measure. And special economic zones particularly, because they don't apply to the country as a whole, they apply to a very, very small part of the country. Um, I've seen scholarly work trying to say, this, this country introduced this, the zone scheme in this year, and let's see, w let's try to run some regressions and see if you get higher growth adding the other million variables that, that some other economists have uh, added in terms of controls. And you don't get anything, or if you get anything, it's just so, it, it, it's obvious that this is just kind of random luck uh, type of numbers. Uh, so it's really hard because there's, it's, a small, it's a small policy. And that's why I would say that the one way to understand w when they can actually benefit a country 
is to, un to look at the institutional context, to look at the problems and whether they seem to be solved and so on. So that's what I'm trying to uh, get to here and I want to take you through a little bit. Um, another, in theory, increased demand for domestic uh, factors of production is what it says there. Um, the, the irony of special economic zones is generally this, that you uh, attract investors uh, who are exporters they want to come because they want to export from another country. Uh, that's how they're going to make it profitable. Well, that's what you're allowing them to do. You're disincentivizing the usage of local factors of production. Nevertheless, people are saying, in theory, they're there to use local factors of production. Labor, yes, agree with that. Uh, but in many cases, they're doing everything not to use the local factors of production, not least because they don't find it in the proper quality, uh, it's not accessible in the in the way they're hoping, for example. Uh, for example, in the Dominican Republic, where I did uh, a lot of field studies, um, it just carbon boxes for anything that you can be transported. It's not really a factor of production, but it, it's part of the transportation of whatever t-shirts you're, you're producing and so on. Uh, they really tried to make it work so that they had a local producer, but those boxes were just never good enough. And they every 20th of them would fall apart when you try to load them. And that was enough just to say it's not good enough. We'd rather import it from the United States. Um, so those kind of things, it's an issue. Sometimes, yes, agriculture, uh, often, of course, you use the crops in the land, great. But often this is exactly the kind of zones that policymakers do not want because they're selling it as a program to get away from resource dependence. We're going to be more industrialized. We're going to do manufacturing and things like that. Um, they don't want agriculture, they often try to discourage it, which is the one uh, area where I would say you're actually using the natural resource, the, the factors of production from the country, and you're incentivized to do that. All right. Um, I would say the most important benefit of special economic zones is if they contribute to actual reforms in the country as a whole. And I think that is very much the, 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 the story of, of China. Um, and I... I I know that at least one person in here might not agree with me on this one, and I heard other people not agreeing with this, but this is from my reading of the political economy story, especially economic zones, uh, very much in terms of what happened in China. Uh, these are the first five special economic zones uh, in China. Uh, they were introduced, as I mentioned, in the late 70s. Um, uh, People talk about the opening and the transformation of China as this uh, Deng Xiaoping had this vision and he did it and he was a force for leader and the lesson is you need a force for leader and that's the end of the story. Um, the zones were very much introduced, uh, he, he was not in favor of this, so this was like the leader more or less of the Communist Party at the time. Um, he, among with most of the uh, ruling elite at the time, did not like the zones. They were not the in initiators. It started with a group of businessmen uh, who wanted to do a business with Hong Kong. So they wanted to set up a zone close to Hong Kong so that they can trade. Um, and what they did was that just to lobby the right people. I'm sure they gave them all kind of cookies and favors. Uh, and somehow they said, okay, you can have your zone. It wasn't threatening enough for the ruling elite. This was still going to be a closed system. Nothing was going to change, but hey, let them have their zone. Somehow that happens. I guess we will never know the details about the dialogue that were going on and how they'd actually, they actually managed to squeeze this thing through. But that was very much what happened. And then uh, when more people, either in business and, and policymakers, saw the opportunities of these zones, uh, you got more and more of them, and they spread out. And then eventually you also had the spreading of some of the policies that first were introduced in the zones in the country as a whole. And if we look at this, uh, the Chinese map, and this is by 2010, all the provincial capitals became special economic zones back in 1992. And that's when you really had this boom in, in, in zones, and you really had more than 50% by then of all municipalities in China had special economic zones. So what is, what, what is special about them then? Um, you know, at some point, you almost got to have to say that this actually has transformed the country as a whole, if most of the country is SECs. Um, so that's China. I think it's a, it's, it's a fascinating story. Um, some problems, yes. <laughs> Let me continue my pessimistic kind of theme. Um, 
Uh, there's one type of problem that, it, that I would call the knowledge problems. Uh, what I mean by knowledge problem is that the policy makers are trying to improve on the economy and they're not really sure how to do it. Uh, just like you, th you can think about industrial policy, you want to build a bridge, where do you build the bridge? How do you know that the money is going to be well spent? Uh, when we're thinking about a corporation investing uh, in any venture, they will do uh, mar re research of the market. What's the demand? How can we make money out of it? Uh, often policymakers, if it's done on, say, the federal level in a really large country, such as the United States or China, um, they are very far away from market conditions and, it's, it, and, and it makes it hard. How can they improve by taking money from the private sector and to make it uh, make it into to make an investment that is would be better than if they would have let it in the hand of the private sector because that's kind of the the goal here and that's it, it's one of the tricks with special economic zones like how do you actually make this happen one problem that you see is that locations of SECs might be really bad they may put them somewhere where it's actually not a good business case from them um, you had uh, Philippines introduced um, uh, special economic zones way back. Uh, there was there was a, a U.S. military base in Bataan in the Philippines, and when they closed that base down, there was all this old infrastructure. And I thought, perfect, it's close to this uh, this this port, and we're going to have a special economic zone. We just have to dredge the port and 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 put up a couple of roads, and we'll be fine. Well, the port never really got put into to practice, and it really was such a remote location. They threw all this money and millions and millions of dollars into this infrastructure, and it was idle. Um, it's, it is today uh, described often as a very successful zone because now you have investors there. But if you look at the whole span of years when they tried to attract, they tried to try to try to get these investors over there by investing more infrastructure, giving more benefits, I cannot see that that zone is actually, it's hard for me to imagine that it's actually have been beneficial for the country to actually have that project. And it's, and it's in, uh, fundamentally um, a knowledge problem that in this case led to a bad location. Uh, another problem is, of course, the infrastructure spending. Uh, Bataan is, is, is kind of an example of that because it's a combination of things. Uh, another uh, example here would be uh, in Nigeria, you had a Calabar zone. And it's one of these zones, too, that is pretty new, uh, and they've thrown a lot of money into it. If you look at pictures, there'll be, um, if, you, if you Google it, it's, it's one of these nice concrete, huge port, like, welcome to the Calabar Zone or something like that. And uh, it's just, you, they just haven't had the investors there. Uh, so you have all this, th the theory is that, hey, we're going to kickstart this African economy and getting all these investors there, and they end up spending so much money. And this is resources that are very scarce and precious in a, in a poor in a poor kind of country. And that's when it becomes particularly acute to think about, well, are you really going to spend this money in a way that's going to benefit the people and, and the country as a whole? And in this case, too, I would say, no, nah, didn't do it. Um, also, uh, production, the, the form of production can be misguided, and that's also a knowledge problem. Often the, the government has an idea. We're going to build uh, this zone that is going to spread a particular, to make our uh, country into a high-tech country. Uh, robotics, uh, often they're trying to kind of be visionary and think into the future. Um, Bangladesh tried to do this. They were, when they established their zones, I think it was in the 80s, pretty late. Um, uh, they had. They were already a, a, a good big textile uh, country, uh, and and it's it, it's a bit funny how they became so. There was a tariff system in place or a quota system in place for textiles called uh, the multi-fiber arrangement. And when that was introduced in '75, uh, it was all about the U.S. The U.S. tried to protect, of course. Textiles is a very, very important business for the U.S. You know, what is the U.S. without your textile business, right? You got like nothing now. Uh, but that was seen as very important to protect that. So therefore, uh, these Asian countries should not be importing, uh, uh, exporting uh, textiles, T-shirts, uh, suits, what have you, into the United States. So they put all these quotas, different quotas for baby clothes and socks, different countries and so on. It was kind of complex. Bangladesh, forget about it. They didn't have anything. They were so, so poor. 
they could never be a threat to, to be actually a textile exporter. Well, what happened was that the Koreans, who now had all these quotas imposed to them, uh, looked over the border, went to Bangladesh, trained Bangladeshi workers, and set up Bangladesh as this huge exporter of textiles. So it's really you really have the United States today to thank for Bangladesh being such a big uh, textile exporter and producer. And uh, what Bangladesh then did was to uh, introduce zones. Now the government steps in and say, "Oh, we're so successful. We, we can do better. We're going to be high tech." So the zones all the zones all have to be really high tech. So that was one of these production misguided uh, decisions in my mind, where things didn't really kick off in these zones. Not until somebody was innovative enough to uh, name their company something like High Tech Knitwear, <laughs> and it's just like it was just a textile company. But the, but the, it passed somehow, and all of a sudden it was the, it was a showcase of hey, we're a textile company. We're setting up in this zone. Actually, this is a good idea, and that's what policymakers said. Oh, okay, yeah, let's let's just allow that, and and therefore Bangladesh continued to be really successful in in that field in the world. Uh, another t type of problem, so if you think about these are two categories, knowledge problem. Uh, government wants to do something for the country, they can't really always get it right, they might not know how to do it. The other problem though is, do they really want to do it? Because special economic zones is a discriminatory policy by nature. And whenever you have a discriminatory policy, you are going to incentivize some people who have the power to give these benefits to ask for something in exchange, uh, you can incentivize that you're, o you're, you're opening up for opportunities for corruption. And that is not to say that everybody wants to be corrupt, it's just to say that it's a very fragile system where a bad apple can do a lot of damage. Uh, that can be the people top, high level in the government, uh, or it can be people just in the bureaucracy who sits in all these uh, authorities that you have to pass through in order to register in a zone. So for the in, in Russia, when they introduced the zones initially, um, it was it was some articles I've been reading about that. They they really describe them as like centers of money laundering and corruption of the oligarchs, because <laughs> uh, they really they had different rules that made it really easy to do these kind of things. Um, it, it certainly didn't serve the purpose of economic development. Uh, in India, you had more of the problem with the, the bureaucracy uh, issues. Uh, one survey from 2004 found that uh, if you were going to register, um, you had to pass through 15 different authorities um, uh, to register in a special economic zone. And that was still like I after some improvement of the, that Indian system. And same survey found that 60% uh, of companies uh, had experience paying irregular payments, that is something in an envelope under the table kind of payment. So if you have to pay for each authority you go through in order to register, uh, what happens? Well, you're not, it's not going to be as profitable for the, the companies. You might think that, well, what does it matter? You're still going to invest and you're still going to hire people. Well, what happens really is that the government gives these benefits Right? Let's say they're, they're cutting your taxes by half. You're therefore willing to invest in the zone. You're willing to incur some of the costs having to do with the corruption. In the end of the day, your benefit is maybe 10% versus 30%, as if you're being taxes were cut by 10%, for example. You may still be fine with that, but that means that there was a transfer that happened from the people who would have benefited from much more economic activity if you would have incentivized to do more and had more of that capital still left in your pocket to the bureaucrat that was on the way just nibbling a little bit. Um, it's like a, it's like a, um, a common resource that everybody is trying to eat a little bit off and hope that nobody else notices, right? Um, so those two, two kind of problems. Let's think then about what is actually successful, especially economic zone. And I, let's, let's, I would start by thinking at the very lower level and then go to kind of the best case scenario here. So the lower level is really what we talked about in terms of a government saying, these are our goals. We want to invest this much. We want to see export increasing by X percent. And let's see if we make it. OK, that's a way that it will often be described as successful. I wouldn't say it's successful. It doesn't tell us whether it actually was 
like you, you in also invested in this infrastructure. What was the cost of that? What is the cost benefit here? It doesn't take that into account. It only looks on very one-sided here uh, in terms of what the results are. The other one I would say uh, is, let's see, okay, that's that one. Um, is whether they're showing superior s performance, not at the expense, though, of the rest of the country. And that's very much dealing with the knowledge and an incentive problem. If you do that, it can be beneficial on net, compared to, say, the status quo. Compared to being completely closed, if you open up through I special economic zones, doesn't mean that it's going to be on net beneficial, but it can be beneficial unless it's eaten up by corruption or you get a lot of misallocation of resources, through the knowledge problem. So this is one level at which you can say, well, if we didn't have the zones, we would be worse off. That's fine. Um, but I want to take it a step further and think about um, even if a special economic zone is successful, um, it may, it, it, it also matters what is the political alternative? What would have happened if it wasn't there to, uh, if it wasn't there available as a policy tool. Now, um, often, from what I see, uh, special economic zones is a very powerful way to avoid broader reforms. If you feel like you need to open up the economy, it can be people lobbying you to do that, you being the government. Um, it can be foreign powers saying, hey, we have to ha be more open here and so on. Or you just ha your export is coming there and, and lobbying you to have more openness in, in the country. Uh, especially economics is a great way to do that. Give them exactly what they want. Open up in a particular area. Say, hey, you can have your zero tariffs and, zero and lower taxes and all that. At the same time, you're keeping a whole system that is closed. So you're keeping all your tariffs and, and, and so on in place. Um, and so it's really a divided system. If you think about the kind of benefits that uh, various companies want, this is a very effective way to make sure that they all get m more or less what they want, and they're all going to give you goodies in return, so to speak. You're pleasing everybody. Which means that if we would think that it's better to have broader reforms, uh, it's actually a bad way, a bad thing that they have these special economic zones at their disposal. Um, you let me know if I have like seven minutes or so left. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, now, I would say that they're generally successful if they actually promote reform. I think that that's what happened in China. Uh, it doesn't mean that it was political reform. It's still this authoritarian system. But in terms of actually spreading some of these economic openness, I think that's exactly what we, what we saw there. So substantial reform something that benefits the country as a whole. I think that's the criteria we have to be looking for. Now the problem why people haven't been looking here, I suspect that it's not that people never thought about, oh, maybe I never thought be something should be good for the economy as a whole, but rather that it's so hard to measure. How do we know? It's so much easier to just look at macro numbers in a particular area before and after, and I can write a paper on it. Uh, and, and, and that's, um, and, and, it, and, I, and I agree that it's, you know, it's, it's a, hard, a hard thing to measure, but that's really what I want to get to here. And it's about understanding the political economy, it's under, uh, understanding the political alternatives. Was it a way to avoid reforms? Was it something that was a top-down project or a bottom-up project? And I think why that matters is this. Anytime, if a government comes up and says, we want to reform the economy, we want special economic zones, we've seen China do it, let's do it. I think the skeptic person w should correctly say, well, if you want more openness, why do you need the zones? You already have the power. You can do it. So why would you think a zone approach is better than general reform? Now, the cynical political economist understands that, oh, they actually don't want to open up because they want to give favors to both the, the protected industries and the more open industries. Makes all the sense in the world. But that means that the policy... Um, uh, implications of understanding special economic zones is not to recommend zones in all, uh, in all instances. It is to recommend them only if there's no way to introduce broader reforms. This is the way to start and maybe it can spread. And there's the dynamic here where maybe the policymakers want to do it, but they have too many um, 
uh, business interests that have monopolized the market against them and they're going to be punishing them. I mean, transportation is one area in a lot of countries where the, the lobby there is so powerful and they can shut down the whole country, right? If you shut down all bus lanes and all trains and all metros in the country in one day, um, that's devastating, and that's usually that's one thing that, that policy makes are often up against. So just because you're a president doesn't mean you have all the power. Um, and it could be that if you're the president and really want to open up, uh, you might do special economic zones in order to avoid some of this resistance, and that can be completely fine. But this implies that you need to understand the political economy context. What are the powers here? What is the power structure? Um, so, uh, what you really want to hear about is, of course, what's happening in this country. Um, giving you a broad overview about what I think is counts as success, what are some of the problems, right? There are in, in different levels here. Right? You have both this knowledge and the incentive problem that will tell you whether just the zones themselves are good compared to the status quo, but then you have the broader analysis of political economy. When does it actually, when is it a way to avoid reforms? When can it actually promote broader reforms? Right? Now, uh, the US has had zones in place uh, since 1935. This was a response to the smooth holly tariffs um, because you had these warehouse and shipping industry, all of a sudden, like, they were going to pay these really high tariffs, and there's just no way that they can do it. So they lobbied the right people to get zones in place, and that's how it started. Um, you have today around, this is the numbers that I've seen lately, 250 uh, called general purpose zones. So these are zones that have to be somewhat adjacent to, say, a port of entry. It can be an airport uh, or a, a port. It can, in certain cases, as I understand, and I'm not 100% sure what the criteria would be, be like in an industrial park area, uh, not necessarily really on either a port or an airport. But these are generally engaged primarily in distribution and wholesaling. So that's the kind of traditional uh, model uh, of, of the zones. And then in the 50s, they introduced these single factory zone model. Uh, these are called the subzones. They are connected to these general purpose zones in some way. They don't have to be located really close to them at a certain distance also from, from um, the general purpose zones. And they are primarily into manufacturing. So here we have uh, more or less the traditional uh, industrial park model. And in addition to that, more, so 25 versus 500 of these uh, subzones, which are generally, as I understand, uh, more or less a rule that they are uh, single factory zones. Uh, single factory zones, of course, means it's one company. It's not these cluster of companies. Um, so that's more or less the model that we're looking at. Um, so knowing that, just the basics, what are the problems here? Uh, if we're thinking about this in terms of are they actually better than ha not having them at all? You start by thinking about the, no the, the uh, knowledge problem. And I would say this is a small one. This is more or less not uh, something I would worry about in the United States. Um, because it, the, it is a, a decentralized system. So just to, to think about a little bit how you can actually solve the knowledge problem. One way is solving the knowledge problem. Because the problem is that people in, in say, a federal government are so far away from the market, the way to solve it is to uh, allow for the decision making to happen closer to the market. Local policy makers doing it rather than federal. And even better, having privately developed zones. So you actually have uh, business people that both have the skin in the game, have the knowledge to understand the market, and third, if things go wrong, which they sometimes never do will, it's not the taxpayers, the people who did not make the initial decision to invest somewhere, who actually have to pay the price. And uh, the US is mm, pretty close. Um, you, it, the, the zone developer can be a, a public or public type corporation, is the code here. Uh, it can be various things, of course, but it's a corporation. It's not the federal government. It's not the state government. That's, that's the uh, main point here. Uh, the main problem I see here is in, uh, an incentive problem. So first of all, just to mention, uh, they're mostly public. Even though they're the corporate, it's public or public-like corporation, there, there will be a lot of public money in here. Uh, one problem with that is always the incentive uh, 
to uh, in to invest more if things are not going well. And that's the I think that's a main threat across the board of successful zones. Things are not going well. Instead of saying, "Oh, we made a mistake. Let's try a different location. Let's try a different industry. Let's try a different approach altogether. Different infrastructure. This is we didn't do it right." Uh, often it's a political project, so the incentive is to throw more money at it, and that's usually where you get. If you think about cost benefit, like that's when things start tipping over to the very much in the wrong end, um, and that's I think that is uh, definitely a, a risk in the United States. But I think that the main my main gripe with this, the zones in the United States is that they are reliant so much on single factory zones. And the problem here is very much as we touched on. Um, if we, we start, if we think a little bit deeper, what the single factory zones are. Um, if I am, am it's, uh, Austin, Texas, for example, uh, they are really good, as are Chicago, where, I'm, where I live now, uh, really good at attracting, say, headquarters and companies by giving them special privileges. Hey, I'll give you this. You don't have to pay anything. I'll give you some extra million here and there and there. Please come here. It's, it's some extent, they're always going to say, well, we attracted them here because, uh, I mean, you're going you're gonna, to, the juiciest deal might be yet to come to Amazon. What are they going to get to establish their, their new headquarters? Uh, it's going to be probably pretty juicy. I'm, uh, you know, I'd love to see a lot of young people and, and fresh blood in, in Chicago, but at the <laughs> same time, I know that I'll be paying taxes for it. Sorry. So like, because they're going to say it's a great thing because you create all these jobs and things like that, but it's the, the cost is often very large. Now, why am I talking about this? Because this is what's generally called like, a targeted tax benefit. Like you, you're, you're saying to a company, hey, uh, if you do this, then I'll give you that. Now, if it's a single factory zone, what's the difference between having a single factory zone and saying, hey, if you establish a zone, we call you a zone and we give you these benefits versus the targeted tax benefits, say, to Amazon? I think the definition is more or less just on paper. I, I, I really don't see that it's very different. So I think that's one of the, one of the problems here. It incentivizes lobbying, of course. I, I'm a company, I want to be a zone. Please make me, a, what do I need to do to become a zone? If everybody can be a zone, then how are you going to dole out these favors? Somehow you're going to need some kind of trading. Um, and there is certainly there's been a lot of lobbying observed in, in, the, in the US context as well. Um, so to conclude, I guess I shall, um, to think about how zones then can actually benefit the United States. Have they benefited the United States yet? <sighs> I don't know. It's really hard to say. I do think that the single factory zones have been a ne negative. I cannot imagine else, uh, anything else. On the other hand, you had the context in which they were introduced. Had you not been able to do these warehousing trading in the in the face of these higher tariffs back in the 30s, maybe it would be very, very bad for the country. Um, well, then the question you have to ask, well, what is the political alternative? If they didn't have the zones, maybe they would have to abolish these tariffs much faster than they did, for example, which is a very fair point. And I think that if we would know that, we could answer the question. We can't, but that's the kind of um, counterfactual political analysis that you have to make to understand whether these, in what, under which conditions they would actually have been good for the United States. Uh, I think that it can become on net a positive uh, with some changes. I would say they should be m larger and more inclusive. Um, larger zones just means more dynamic, uh, not so, and, and the larger they are, the less you get of this targeted tax benefit kind of form. It, it serves you less to lobby to get the zone if it also benefits 100 other of your competitors, if it's not only for you. It's, it's more costly, and once you get the zone, it's not only for you. So you get less waste just through that channel. Um, privately developed, I would say, it would be, I mean, this is, this is not like China, right? Like you, most of the things is privately developed. We think of business here. It shouldn't be so hard to do in the, in the special economic zone uh, context here. Um, and uh, if, if more concentration of regulatory rather than fiscal exemptions. I, could, I can imagine that a lot of states that have really bad regulations will be different bad regulations, and if the zones can be used somehow to avoid those regulations, that could be fine. You know? But you could still, you still have to ask yourself, uh, what is the alternative? Because I would say broader reforms are always best. It's, it, so per definition, in economic terms, special economic zones is not a good idea. But 
in political terms, they can be a very good idea because it's the one way in which you can get reforms or get a step towards reforms, get some exemptions. It can be really crucial breathing holes for a lot of companies. Uh, so in that way, I would say um, uh, it all depends on whether it's possible to do more broader reform, to have more broader reforms in place, and I think it should be possible in the United States case. But I could be proven wrong on that uh, for people who knows uh, the intricacies more of U.S. politics. Um, and, and, and we shall remember that in their absence, the U.S. may have been a much, more, much more open to trade today. I mean, we may have been you know, a step towards a little bit more open in the country as a whole. And when we're talking country as a whole, it's a very, very big country. So that could have made a much more uh, bigger contribution to the economy than having the zones in place. So that again goes to the political question of what is actual alternative. Will you be forced to open up if you don't have this tool at your disposal uh, by which you can divide the economy? With that, I thank you so much for listening. This has been really long. I thank you so much. And if you're interested in hearing more, I have my book here. So and come out and talk to me afterwards. Thanks. <laughs>